we have Elaine working the slides this morning. Thank you for doing it. But uh, Olga, if you'll start. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And then the promise. When I seek the Lord my God, I will find him if I seek him with all my heart and with all my soul. So as I mentioned last week, I've been looking at my chronological Bible for the sequence of these encounters. And we stepped out of last week, we stepped out of sequence. And um, we looked at the two encounters from chapters three and four, the insider and the outcast. So the outcast was the woman at the well, the insider was Nicodemus. And we saw that even though they were very different from each other, they really had a lot in common in that they were both sinners in need of grace. And they were both caught up in a system, but their systems they were caught up in were very different from each other. But they needed a savior, not a system. And so the message is the same for you and me. There is no system that can save us. Not the church we attend, not the good works we perform, um, not the families we were born into, not the Bible study we belong to, not, not, not that any of these things are bad, but if we're relying on them or on anything other than Jesus to be our Savior, it is sin. He regards it as sin. And so systems are substitutes, not saviors. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. For God represented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So we were challenged to ask Jesus if we are allowing any substitute in our lives. We want him to point out any person or anything that's in front of him. I keep saying this because it's really helped me. I want to put Jesus in front of everything and every one. And so um, we're now going back to one of the encounters that we skipped over, and that is the first miracle did in his public ministry, and it took place at a wedding. And as I said, I'm pulling um, from Tim Keller's book, Encounters with Jesus, which inspired this series. I'm also pulling from a devotional Ray Stedman wrote um, regarding this passage uh, just a devotional he wrote about it. And then, like I said, some direct incomings from the middle of the night. <laughs> and so anyway, to put the story in context, Jesus had been in Judea where John the Baptist was baptizing. And that's where he encountered John and Andrew and Simon Peter, Philip and Nathaniel. We've already looked at those encounters. So the scene has shifted from there to 70 miles north of there in the area of Galilee. And Jesus and his disciples have all walked that distance, and they arrive in Cana, where they were invited to a wedding. Now, before we read the story, it's important to understand something about ancient uh, and traditional cultures. It's that they put far more emphasis on family and community than on the individual. Meaning in life was to be found not in the individual achievement, but in being a good family member. Um, so the purpose of a marriage was not primarily the happiness of the two individuals, um, but instead it was to bind the community together and to raise the next generation. That was the purpose. And so the purpose of marriage was for the good of the commonwealth. So the bigger, stronger, and more numerous the families of a town, the better economy, or the stronger the military security would be. Um, and when these things happened, the more everybody flourished. So this meant that weddings and wedding feasts were a far bigger deal than they are to us today. Each wedding was a public feast for the entire town. And marriage was about the whole community, not just the couple. At the same time, it was also the biggest event in the personal lives of both the bride and the groom, because this was the day that they came of age to their society. They became full members of their society. 
So ancient wedding feasts went on for days and sometimes a week and sometimes even longer. And so with this in mind, we can see that our story opens abruptly with a, with a great disaster. Um, perhaps just a day or two into the festivities, the family ran out of wine. And wine was back then the single most important element of an ancient feast. And so essentially the party was over. The wine was gone, the party ended. (laughs) And this was not a mere breach of etiquette, but it was a social and psychological catastrophe, particularly in this traditional honor, shame, honor and shame culture. So with that backdrop, we're going to read the story. We'll have Olga read it. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So <clears throat> it's significant that John mentions that this in the very beginning of the story, that this was on the third day. He is referring, of course, to the third day after Jesus had left Judea. Uh, it was a two-day walk to Galilee, and they would have arrived on the morning of the third day. And so, but John mentions Uh, this happened on the third day because it has symbolic meaning. Now, understand too, or remember that, John wrote his gospel much later than the other gospels. So he wrote his gospel some 30 or 40 years after these events had taken place. So he had had a lot of time to carefully review the events and um, to select the important things to stress And so everything in the Gospel of John is important and put there for a specific reason. So, for starters, let's notice in verse 11 that John referred to this not not merely as a miracle, but as a sign. And a sign is a symbol or a signifier of something else. So signs are miracles that have a meaning. And they are intended to convey truth that would not otherwise be known, to manifest a significance that might otherwise be hidden. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So what does this sign tell us? Well, this mention of the third day is a hint. This is a reference to what is clearly evident elsewhere in Scripture as um, the resurre- it's a reference to the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus had not yet taken place, of course, but even in the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament, there's a reference to the third day as being the day in which Israel would be spiritually healed and returned to her Lord. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So with this in mind, note that Jesus did not have to exercise his power in the situation. He chose to. 
And when he did, it became the first time that he manifested and revealed his glory to people. This was the first time that he disclosed his true identity in public. So clearly there's a message he wants to send about himself by choosing to change water into a whole lot of wine to keep a party going um, as his first signifying use of his supernatural power. But what would that message be? And so there are some multiple truths that um, I've discovered um, by both studying as well as just meditating on the whole passage. Um, multiple truths he's revealing about himself through this miraculous sign. So in verse 9, we're introduced to the master of the feast. Now, he was the master of ceremony, so to speak, and it was his job to make sure the conditions for the celebration were all in place to make the party great, okay? And we don't know if he was the one responsible for ordering the wine. So I was doing all this research trying to figure out what exactly were the masters of the feast to do? You know, what was their job? Was it ordering the wine? <laughs> well, nowhere I couldn't find it. We don't know if it was him that was to order it. We don't know if it was the groom who failed. Maybe neither of them failed. Maybe they had ordered it and maybe the wine supplier couldn't keep promises they promised. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. Bottom line, someone had failed. And so Jesus turns the water into wine and saves the day. But Jesus takes no credit for it. In fact, only Mary, at least in the beginning, only Mary and the servants know he was involved at all. Um, now, think about what it would have been like to be in the shoes of the person whose responsibility it was to have the wine there. And then all this wine shows up. I mean, what a relief, right? Jesus became the substitutionary master of ceremonies to cover for the screw up. So he ultimately took the responsibility of the failure and he made everything right. And that's what he does in our lives. This first thing that comes to mind about this sign is that's what he does for us. He takes on all of our sin and he makes us right with God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He becomes our advocate. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Another lesson for us is that even when we think we're in control of things, we have a position of power and we've got our act together and we did all the right things, we ordered everything, we did everything. You know what? We don't. We're not in control. Um, that master of the feast most likely thought he had his ducks in a row. But we're not, control, we're not in control of anything. No matter what we think we're in control of, we do not, our, even our best laid plans can fail us. Uh, but Jesus revealed through this act that he is the true master of ceremonies in all of life. He's Lord of the feast. He's in control of everything. And he was demonstrating the truth that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Everything was created through him and for him. And they are seeing firsthand what Jesus would later proclaim. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So by this sign, he is demonstrating his authority. He's demonstrating his power, his power over nature. Jesus took a commonplace thing, simple water, and made wine of it. And this sign shows us that he can take the ordinary things of our lives, the things that maybe even have no value, and make wine of them. He can make value of them. He can take anything 
and make it a source of joy, of glory, and of warmth. And you might say, but I thought Jesus came to humble himself, to lose his glory, and to be rejected, and go to the cross. And why would he, come, why would he exalt himself this way in this first sign? But what he's really doing is putting it all into context. The sign signifies that, yes, though he would suffer and deny himself and that there would be great sacrifice, not only for him, but also for his followers. But it was all a means to an end. And it would all take place in order to bring about that third day, the resurrection. It was all take place to bring about the new heavens and the new earth, and it would end all evil and death and tears. And it points to our future, the joys ahead, the eternal feast for God's people that's coming at the end of history. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So it seems that through this sign, his first sign, he was giving us a taste of his goodness and of a future event that's going to happen in our lives. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. He's revealing his generosity. He's revealing his prodigality. You know, prodigal, that word prodigal, it actually means recklessly extravagant. He's revealing that about himself. He's disclosing what he came to do, and it goes back to our foundational verse for the study. Olga. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So think about it. It was pointed out to him that they were out of wine. And what did he do? Okay, he took six water jars, each holding 20 to 30 gallons, had them filled with water, and he turned all of that into wine. And so I looked it up. Okay, how much wine would that be? (laughs) And it was between, if it were 20 gallons, 604.4 bottles to 908.4 bottles of wine. Now, that is abundance, would you not say? Mary came to Jesus and stated the problem that the people had, and he responded exceedingly abundantly beyond what she asked for or could have even imagined, (laughs) wouldn't you say? So the question is, what have you run out of? You run out of strength or courage? Or maybe you run out of love for somebody who's driving you crazy? In what way have you come to the end of your resources? Whatever it is, just like Mary, Tell Jesus about it. Just tell him about it. Give it over to him and then stand back. <laughs> watch, watch what he might do with it. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So here then is the first hint in the account of the significance of this first miracle of changing water into wine. It was a miracle of transformation. It was a miracle of bringing life out of death, of bringing joy in place of sorrow. This is what the miracle symbolizes. But let's look at another detail of it. Clearly, he rescues this young bride and groom from their plight. But how he does it is significant to note. Jesus directs the servants to fill up jars used by the Jews for ceremonial cleansing and purification. And the servants could have easily chosen not to do what he had asked. <clears throat> How would Jesus asking them to fill these jars with water have anything to do with being out of wine? It made no sense. It was seemingly all unrelated. But often he works that way with us. He calls us to walk in obedience to him, not to understand what he's asking of us and why. So he gave the servants something to do that they could do, that they had the power to do. And then through their obedience, he accomplished what they could not. So this is a beautiful example of that divine human synergy that's constantly at work. He involved these servants in his transforming work, even it was far beyond anything they could ever achieve on their own. And this is how he works with us. He gives us the things to do we can, and then he does what we cannot. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Right after that, Paul goes on to say in the very next verse, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So what is he asking of you to do that makes no sense? <laughs> Are you grumbling about it? <laughs> or even disputing with them about it or with someone else about it? Now, for those servants, that would have been a lot of water to haul. And they did it. And not only that, it says that they filled the jars all the way to the brim. They were not minimalists. They were wholehearted. So I don't know if you guys have run into this, but two days ago I ran into this where you just run into these people and they're, I'm just calling them minimalists, where they want to do the least amount necessary to help you. And I had three of them in a row on Tuesday morning. <laughs> And I thought, oh, you know, it's so frustrating. And yet I kept, okay, I'm going to put Jesus in front of this. And I'm not going to let it rob me of my joy. And I just had to keep doing it again and again and again. And what was interesting about it, I just kept being kind, even though they were not only being minimalist, but they were being unkind. They were being rude. And I'm just going to keep being kind and keep, you know, because what I was asking for was not out of line. And it was actually caused by a mistake they had made. And, and so anyway, by the end of the day, it required a couple of phone calls to finalize because they refused to do it with me there. And so it's like, okay, you know, great. You know, and, and so by the end of the day, after these two phone calls with these two people that were the rudest of the three, they were like, so nice. It's like something happened where they were, I don't know why I'm interjecting that story. But anyway, these guys were not minimalists. They filled these water jugs all the way to the brim. And the quantity of wine was determined by how much water they poured into the jars. What if they'd only put a little bit in? But because of their obedience and their wholeheartedness, Jesus was able to act in a miraculous way and provide an abundance, and everybody benefited. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, 
and he will make straight your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Now back to those stone jars. So Old Testament Judaism contained many rites and regulations which required various courses of physical cleansing and purification, all in order to point out our spiritual need. And these vividly express the idea that, you know what, God is holy and he's pure and he's perfect and you are faulty and you are flawed. And it's what he was constantly show them is that in order to connect to God, there must be atonement. There must be a cleansing. There must be pardon. We cannot just walk into his presence. So the Jews had many purification rites leading up to the blood sacrifices. And that's what these jars were normally used for. So what message might he be sending by using these jars to accomplish this miracle? Well, it was clear that the jars, the jars themselves had nothing to do with transforming the water into wine. They had no ability to do it. They were just stone jars. It was Jesus who transformed the elements within them. And he is revealing that he has come into this world to accomplish in reality what the ceremonial and sacrificial laws of the Old Testament could never accomplish. So Jesus was rescuing this young couple from the embarrassment and humiliation and of certain public shame because this was a shame and honor culture. And he chose to do it by employing the jars normally used for purification and ceremonial washing. But it wasn't the jars that took away their shame. It was his transforming power. You see the connection here? The result for them and all involved was overwhelming joy. Can you imagine how happy people <laughs> were when the wine showed up? <laughs> but just like those stone jars without Jesus, we are empty and we are powerless to solve our problems. Whether we admit it or not, we all know down deep inside that we are not perfect. And we often want to cover up and hide because of it. We feel shame. We all know in truth that we need to be cleansed. We need to be purified. And if we live long enough and we're honest, we know beyond doubt that there are things in our hearts that are sinful. There's self-centeredness. There's pride and self-righteousness. And as soon as we feel like you know what, we don't really have any of that. Well, then the pride comes back in. <laughs> There's selfishness and bitterness and unforgiveness and all sorts of unclean things that can lodge themselves deep within us. And we need Jesus to cleanse us from these. We need him to purify us. We cannot, just like those jars, we cannot do it on our own. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Wow. <clears throat> but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, as this is true for everyone who believes no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. And so we are stained and we are in desperate need of purification. And we can feel shame. And this is exactly what the enemy wants. He wants, to, he wants to pull us into shame, and he's trying to do it all the time. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And notice right before the fall, in the end of chapter 2, uh, Scripture tells us, Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. There was no shame at all before the fall. But even though they were naked before each other, they were naked before God, there was no shame. But that changed after they chose to disobey God. 
their relationship with him was broken, and uh, that is when shame entered the world. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So the truth is, all of our accomplishments and our good works are just one big fig leaf without Jesus. And they're never going to be, in the end, enough to cover up what's wrong with us. And we know that goes on to tell us in that chapter 3 that God then took an animal, the skins of an animal, and made proper coverings for them. And that was the first blood sacrifice. And that's when the whole thing began. Um, He's the only one that can cover our sins. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds... They are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So this sign shows us that though we are powerless to change, just like those empty jars at that wedding, when we receive Jesus into our hearts, he transforms our powerless empty vessels in a way that only he can do. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are simply clay in the hands of the Father. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, we are all the work of your hand. So Jesus did not come to tell us how to save ourselves, He came to save us himself. He came to die, to shed his blood, to take the cup of curse and punishment so we can raise the cup of blessing and love. And by choosing the ceremonial purification jars, Jesus was signaling that he had fulfilled the whole Old Testament sacrificial system The tabernacle, the temple, the veil, the inner chamber called the Holy of Holies, at the heart of that system was a blood sacrifice. And and it, it had to happen because we were all sinners and our sins need to be atoned for. And they cannot be atoned for without the shedding of blood. And according to the law, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So something had to atone for our sins. Something, someone had to die in our place. And Jesus came to earth to become the sacrificial lamb to take away our sins. And he, and he did that. He did just that. He is the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. That is what he came to bring everyone. And through substitutionary sacrifice, he freed us. Not only freed us of the guilt and the shame, but he did all this so he could love us and perfect us. And so that eventually one day on that day, we can fall into his arms and be his spouse forever. So back to whoever it was that was supposed to supply the wine. It's important to notice that Jesus didn't condemn them. He didn't lecture them or point out their folly or their failures or their flaws, he simply quietly and discreetly acted in a way to remove their guilt and their shame. And he does this for you and for me. A lot of years ago, I had a situation where a person who I really looked up to and who was a godly person, you know, in leadership and all, um, do something that was really wrong. And it, you know, totally affected me. It was, had a huge impact and it was really wrong. And, and I remember just going to the Lord saying, Lord, look at this. This is not right. It's so wrong. And then I started praying, expose that person, expose that person. You know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me. What if I exposed everything I've covered up for you? <laughs> what if I go back through the years and just 
what if I'd exposed, and he started pointing to some things, and I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> have mercy on that person. <laughs> so he covered for that sin and that failure and that flaw, and he does that for you and for me. And so um, we can waste another's flip side of that. We can waste time and energy beating ourselves up for our own failures, and Jesus simply wants us to acknowledge them confess them, and then give them to him. And when we do that, then he cleanses us from them so we can be just free again to, to love him and serve him and be in his presence. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Another thing he's doing here is he's modeling to us how we're to treat others who blunder. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So is there somebody who's kind of messed up that you know in your life, maybe a family member, a good friend, or whatever? How are you handling it? Like Jesus modeled? Or do you tend to like want to point it out and give a little lecture? And <laughs> he tells us to bear with each other, forgive. And he shows us that he came to bring transformation and a joy that we can never achieve on our own. But how does he bring this healing and this cleansing and this forgiveness? And here's where we get to the narrative heart of the passage. Mary tells Jesus that the party's out of wine. And she, so she simply tells him about the problem. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And then he says, My hour has not yet come. So Jesus refers to his hour several other times in the book of John. <clears throat> And in each case, he's speaking about the occasion of his death. His hour is the moment of his death on the cross. And so why does Jesus connect a simple request for wine with the hour of his death? Well, think of the symbolism of it. What might the wine represent? You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants, for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So wine gladdens the heart. And so what is missing from the picture that's necessary to turn the shame, or the water, into the joy, the wine? Well, when Jesus makes a statement of, what does this have to do with me? It's as if we are, and I pulled this from the Tim Keller book. It's as if he were looking past the whole wedding scene and seeing something else. In the Old Testament, God wants to show us that he doesn't want to just be, uh, he doesn't want to uh, relate to us only as like a king relates to his subjects. Um, but as a groom relates to his bride. He wants a love relationship with us, as profound as a relationship between a husband and a wife. And often in the Hebrew scripture, God presents himself as the bridegroom of his people. And in the New Testament, when the disciples are criticized for not fasting, Jesus said, Jesus said to them, 
Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? So Jesus calls himself the bridegroom, and he does so in full awareness that according to scripture, only the creator, the God of the universe, is the husband of his people. But at the end of the New Testament, look at what it says. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. So as mentioned earlier, at the end of time, there will be a feast and all feasts. Um, it's going to be a wedding feast, and it's going to celebrate at long last the intimate and per permanent union of God with the people that he loves, the people he loves, and the people who love him. And this is how history is going to end, and it's what Jesus came to accomplish. We, the bride, the people Jesus has loved, will finally be united with him. And the most rapturous love of any kind of wedding on earth is only going to be the dimmest hint and echo of what that's going to be like. And that's our future reality. And so Jesus is saturated in the Old Testament scriptures, and he identifies as the great bridegroom, even though all of his work is still ahead of him. So this is what Keller says. Could it be at this wedding feast that Jesus is thinking about this coming wedding feast with you and me? Maybe what he's really saying to his mother is, in order for my people to fall into my arms, I'm going to have to die. For my people to drink the cup of joy and festival blessing, I'm going to have to drink the cup of justice and punishment and death. And there's that verse again we saw before. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the answer to the question of how is Jesus going to bring us our joy? By losing all of his. By leaving his heavenly existence with the Father, by coming to earth to lead a lonely, misunderstood life, by going to the cross and dying in our place. Jesus sat amidst oh, all the joy. Hold on a second. I just want to say that this is Dr. Edmund Clowney, and he preached a sermon on this topic. And this is what this is a statement from him. Go ahead. Jesus sat amidst all the joy of the wedding feast, sipping the coming sorrow, so that today you and I who believe in him can sit amidst all this world's sorrow, sipping the coming joy. No matter what's going on around us, when we keep that eternal focus, we can sip the cup of the coming joy rather than wallowing in sorrow. And we have enormous stability because of the coming joy. We have to look forward to that lamb's party. <laughs> And every time we participate in the Lord's Supper by faith, we're getting a foretaste of that incredible feast. Even if right now we're in the midst of sorrow, we can sip the coming joy. And every time God chooses a metaphor to help us, help us see him better, it also shows us how he sees us. So if he is like our bridegroom, he uses that as a metaphor, then when we give ourselves to Jesus in faith, it means that he sees us as his bride and he delights in us. And every time God chooses an image for himself, he's saying something about us. And what does the bride look like to the groom when she's walking down the aisle? He is absolutely delighted in her. And so could it be that that's the way he loves us? Could it be that he delights in us like that? 
The truth is, he does. He tells us this all through scripture. The question is, do we believe it? For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. For the Lord delights in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said, desolate. But you will be called, my delight is in her. And your land, married, for the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And so, what will it look like to you to live in moment-by-moment moment awareness of this truth that he delights in you? He sees you as his bride, and he's so in love with you. He's not here to condemn you. He's here to save you so he can love on you for all eternity. And so let's go to the hand out there and have Olga read from Ken Boa's Transforming Prayers. Dear Lord, from the beginning of history, you have desired to have communion with your people and have delighted in those who passionately wanted to walk with you. I thank you for the imagery of table fellowship that runs from Genesis to Revelation and portrays your acceptance and communion with your people. I thank you for the God-man who ate and drank with his fellow followers during the years of his ministry, just before his death and after his resurrection. And I thank you for the great celebration to come when we will share in the marriage supper of the Lamb and as we celebrate through the communion elements of bread and wine, our salvation and fellowship with you and with the restored community of faith, may we rejoice in all you have done and in all you will do in the ages to come. Amen. Thoughts or comments or questions? <laughs> this wasn't part of the lesson, but it reminds me of how um, I kept thinking of it, how Jesus helped me and did it with a sort of a picture. Um, yesterday, there was uh, tornado warnings where I lived. It was for a short period of time, but I'm terrifically afraid of wind and, you know, strong rain and everything, and I was scared. And all I could do was pray, help, help. And Jesus brought to my mind, you know, the picture of him out on the sea, you know, with a storm raging, mm -hmm. and he was asleep. Mm -hmm. But then, beside that, I have a, a small tree in my backyard that it's a, um, I forget what it is, but it's actually a vine mm -hmm. made into a tree. So it's all these, you know, branches like that, like a, like a vine would be. Mm -hmm. And I looked out the window and there is a little bird in the branches. <laughs> the wind's blowing and the rain is coming down. And there's no leaves to protect it or anything. It's just these bare branches. But it reminded me of a picture uh, that won, you know, an award for uh, a painting that was done of peace. Mm -hmm. And it was a picture of a huge storm. Mm -hmm. And a little bird safe in, actually, I think it was a crag, of, mm -hmm. you know. But it just, and I kept going back and looking at that bird to make sure he was still there. But it was, it was a picture of how 
God mm -hmm. just has us mm -hmm. in his hand. Mm -hmm. And he knew I needed even more than just a mental thing, because mm -hmm. I can argue with myself, is mm -hmm. this just me, you know, or mm -hmm. is it Jesus? But seeing that little bird just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? <laughs> it was a wonderful picture to yeah, me. That's great. Yeah. Olga. Um, I want to go back to uh, Philippians 2 and 14, do all things without grumbling and disputing. That is so hard. <laughs> no. That is so hard to do. It's, I remember when I was caregiver for my mother, mm -hmm. there are just things that yeah. happen during the course of those years where you just complain, but it's... <laughs> You still love her, oh, you know, yeah. but it's it's just hard. It's hard. And it's, it, I don't know if it's truly complaining or just saying things that are just going on. Mm -hmm. And it sounds, it is negative, but I mean, you're just talking about the events of the day and um, you're worn down, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it's, it's a verse that I kept on my vanity every day and it's it's really um a challenge mm -hmm. <laughs> really mm -hmm. a challenge well i think the there are four things that kept the children of israel that made god angry when they were wandering in the wilderness um to the point where he said you're not going to go to the promised land you're going to all die and they were see if i remember them <laughs> greed gluttony, grumbling, and what was the fourth one? No, they're all G's. <laughs> <laughs> Greed, gluttony, grumbling, and gossip. gossip. That's what the other one was, gossip. And you think, wow, you know, those made him angry. And so I think... Sometimes when you're in a situation like that, because I went through the caregiving years with my folks, and and it's like there I had my accountability partner. You know, there've got to be a place where you can get it out. You know, this is what's going on, and and where you're just I don't know if it's venting, but it's getting it out. And and I don't know if that really counts as it. It's when when I'm what I'm thinking of the grumbling is when you know it really is grumbling, and that's a different thing than confiding in a person of this is what is going on right now and this is very challenging and you're stating the circumstances like you said you know because this it sounds negative but it is <laughs> i'm just stating the facts and they're negative <laughs> versus grumbling and and grumbling even i catch myself if i see something going on i don't watch the news but say that i'm reading something on the internet or something and I'll, you know, I'll be frustrated by something I see going on. And, you know, that can turn into grumbling. And I think he doesn't want us to do that. And um, so we want to be clear on what it is. There's one thing about, yes, I'm going through a difficult time and I need to really talk, talk it through versus grumbling. You know, I don't want, you know, that's a different kind of thing. Yeah. And so... He's calling us to do things. I mean, you know, sometimes there are certain tasks that I don't really enjoy. And I can either talk to myself about how I really don't like doing this, or I can say, okay, Jesus, let's do this together. Give me an idea about how to do this better. And it's really different when you start approaching doing something like that than it is when, oh, I have to do this. That's more of a grumble. Yeah. Linda. Um, years ago, when we opened our new building at church, I was trained to walk people through all, all the different rooms. And I, I'm still called you know, to do that with new people that walk in. And we actually, across from the gym, there's a uh, foyer. In, oh, by the I gym, know what you're going to say. Yeah, you know about that. <laughs> so uh, I probably showed you. There's a wall and there's a door. And you open up the door and well, there's a wall. Before you open it, what's on the outside of the door? Uh, Sign. It's signed, you know, about opening it. Yes. It's the it's complaint, a complaint department. Room. Yes. It's the so complaint room. It is for complaints. Yes. Yes. And, you know, and people look at me and I go, yeah. Yeah. 
So I open it up, and it's, there's a wall, and, it, <laughs> and, and there, that verse is there. You exactly do not. You know, exactly. and they read it, and some of them laugh, but it's amazing how pe- some people actually stop, and what does that mean? And, I, and, I, and, you know, besides the obvious, I said, well, grumbling, you, you, you have an audience. You don't grumble to yourself. So that's gossip, and that's, that's not healthy. And complaining, if you have a complaint, you're, you need to go to the, one of the pastors and so that we can either fix it or, exp, or explain it. Yeah. You know, and they, they kind of look at me because I, I have a um, problem. I'm, I'm too straight. You know, I'm too, I don't. <laughs> She's direct. There's, there's no velvet on the brick. Yeah, there. exactly. There's no velvet on her hammer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and they, they, that's like, oh, okay. And they absorb it. But anyway, um, it. It's a good way to start a relationship with a new member. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I wanted to mention about the um, the wedding. And the wedding is to become one. So it's not so much, in my mind, the human wedding, but the oneness with with Jesus. And it's interesting that the G- Genesis had a wedding. Jesus' first miracle was a wedding. Mm-hmm. And Revelation at the end is, is a wedding. wedding. Yeah. And it's just like it's throughout the Bible. It is, the narrative throughout the It's word. so powerful. So it thank is. you for, I've learned a lot mm-hmm. in this lesson. Faith. Come in this way. Well, when, when it came up about the shame from the, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, it made me think about um, little children. How they have no shame, like, you know, completely being naked and everything. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, when they reach a certain age, it kicks in. Mm -hmm. And they they realize, I guess, Mm -hmm. that (laughs) they don't want to be naked anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of like, you know, children. And I, I just think of this, that one of the reasons Jesus loves children so much is they're like that. They're mm-hmm. innocent. They mm-hmm. accept, you know, that mm-hmm. they haven't been, you know, brought down yet or right. defeated or, or whatever. They're just, you know, happy. Yeah. They're, they're naked and they don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> carefree. It's because someone has sent something to them. Yeah. yeah. About, you know, you're too old to run around like that. Yeah. Or right. Somebody has said something. Right. Isn't that like Satan? Yeah. Adam and Eve? Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. I kind of think it's like you know, we're uh, uh, yeah, we better, we better get the mics on people. <laughs> How Jesus talks about the age, or the somewhere in the Bible, it's about the age of accountability. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's maybe something mm-hmm. that, that yeah. it, it, it shows graphically yes. in children it, when yes. they have an age of inno- innocence and then mm-hmm. when they don't anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. There the, is a de- definite yeah. time. Where they now are under, they have accountability. They understand sin. Yeah. Gloria. Um, I think two things that are really hard for me to grasp are that there is no condemnation Mm -hmm. in Christ. Mm -hmm. And also that how much he loves us. Mm That when it says he will rejoice over you, Mm -hmm. he takes delight in you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just the amount that he delights in us Mm -hmm. is something I think that is so huge. We really can't grasp it. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, there's he delights in us when we have all this that we could be condemned for. Mm -hmm. You know, I think. That's just another thing to ponder. <laughs> yeah. It's because he takes on all of our sin. That's the thing that um, he, so it's the double imputation where he, you know, in the moment that you come to Christ, you receive him into your heart. The double imputation is that he takes all of his righteousness and puts it onto you, and that displaces all of your sin, and it puts it onto him. So there's the double. He imputes his righteousness, and then he imputes your sinfulness 
on himself. He takes it on. So it's grasping that, that it's not, we see our behavior and we know inside we're flawed. Like I said, I know my flaws, but that he imparts to us then through sanctification, his righteousness, but it's already done when we come to him. So there's an instant that it happens, but then there's an ongoing becoming. We already are, and we're becoming all at the same time. But um, that, for me, for years, the condemnation thing was really hard to grasp. And and I can remember one time having a, a phone call with my mom. I guess somehow I thought that maybe it was humility if I were to say, oh, you know, I'm just not that or I'm just not this or, you know, kind of belittle myself or something, thinking that was like being humble. And she called me on it one day. She said, you know what? Do you know how much Jesus loves you? And it hurts his feelings when you talk about yourself that way. And, I, and that just stopped me in my tracks. There's no condemnation because you're in Him. And, and so it really caused me to pay attention to when I saw myself that way or when I would beat myself up for something. I would then begin, and I actually started having a whole list of truths about myself that I started literally carrying around with me so I could reprogram my brain so that when I would go to that inner self-talk that was negative, I would then wait, wait, let's go. What's the truth? The truth is, no, I'm, I'm, um, I'm his beloved. And, and I am perfect in him because of what he has done. And I start speaking truth to myself. And, and now those, those old, um, just that old memory or whatever, you know, that needed to be purified, cleansed. It just happens less and less and less and less, but it takes a lot of effort to let him reprogram your mind that way with truth. And so that's why you want to fill your mind with truth from Scripture, and Scripture is that he delights in you, even on your worst day. The one that knows you the best loves you the most. And this isn't to say, oh, then I can just live however I want. No, because out of his great love, the most miserable thing is when you're walking in disobedience because he, because he loves you, convicts you. And that's a, that's a horrible feeling to be convicted like that, and yet it's because he loves you so much that he's doing it. But when you're walking in o- obedience, even in small little things, that peace and that joy and that being in his presence, um, it just makes the disobedience so much more uncomfortable that's like, I don't want to do that. I, I just want to, I want to seek, seek him, put him in front of everything. What a different way of living. It's just a joyful way. Even, you know, I mentioned having these encounters that were frustrating, you know, and even in those moments, nope, I'm going to put you in front of this. And I'm not going to step out of the joy. And um, it's just a, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it takes effort in that you get to re, your mind gets to be reprogrammed because the enemy is constantly trying to keep his thumb on you and make you feel condemnation. That's where he wants you. And so. It's a it's a wonderful joy to start stepping out of that, Gloria. Yeah, you know, I took care of my mom, and towards the end, it got it was over the top, mm-hmm. and I lost it so many times. And after she passed away, I felt so bad about that too. And yet, <clears throat> when things would go on throughout the day. I would go to my mom, at, you know, in, in the evening and go, Mom, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have. And my mom would go, stop, you stop right there. Where would I be, with, you know, without yeah, exactly. you? It, it was yeah. it was incredible, Yeah, you know. But I still felt bad after she died. <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, you think it's about like, and if she were able to do that, 
Think about how exactly. much more is he doing that for us. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those are challenging times. Lori. It's interesting this topic is, has come up today. Um, Olga starting us off, but before coming, I was feeling a lot of those things that you were talking about, um, Gloria. Uh, my mom, t- taking care of her and the grumbling and <laughs> um, the regret. Um, I'm not sure why this morning more than other mornings, but feeling that regret and condemnation and wishing I had done things differently and wishing I had not said some things and wishing I had said some things. And I think I had forgotten that it's a common, something that we share as women, um, something that we go through as um, our parents leave us and um it's just very healing to sit mm-hmm. among you women this morning. Thank you. Mm-hmm. A lot of us have been through that journey. And, and I can remember very distinctly um, when I was still in Florida and my, I had moved my parents. It was the day after that they had arrived in Michigan. We had to move them up to assisted living in Michigan where mom wanted to be, where her sisters and all the family was. They were alone down in Florida, and so we moved them back up to where all the family was. But I remember um, what a breakthrough it was for me when I was kind of going through the things I had done wrong and feeling the condemnation, you know, the things where I had. And how he was pointing out to me, some of it wasn't as wrong as I thought, um, that I was, you know, making it much bigger than it needed to be, but it was this, it was like he spoke to me to say, and I was going through a, a very detailed how to, just about, um, it, was, it was a study on how to forgive, and a big part of it was forgiving yourself. And he showed me through that process that morning that even if I had done it all as badly as I thought, which he showed me it wasn't as badly as I thought, but even if I had, it was covered in the blood. And there's no condemnation. And it was so freeing to say, are you going to really believe what I say is true? Then will you receive? And, And let's get back into the joy. And it was so powerful and freeing to break through that um, and just move into a new, you know, kind of a new chapter. Because it, but it wasn't only just the um, caregiving, but I was going back into my early days and things that I was kind of heaping on from maybe how I'd failed as a child by certain things in my past. And that's what he was showing. It's even if you did, you know, really, I was following Jesus, and that meant I wasn't around my folks that much. But I was following him, and it took me on an independent path. And so the truth was, I wasn't really, I was doing the right thing, even though it felt wrong. (laughs) And he showed me that even if it was wrong, though it wasn't, it's covered under the blood. So let's get on, you know. And so it was just a real breakthrough for me. Um, I used to pre-COVID volunteer at Mesa Vista Mm -hmm. with my dog and the 12 step program is Mm -hmm. what we did every month. And that's the, that's why that is the most successful program to break free of addiction Mm -hmm. is forgiving yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, forgiving others, making lists of, of things that you have done wrong and other mm-hmm. people have done wrong mm-hmm. and going through that cleansing mm-hmm. process. It, it's, it's amazing. It's so freeing it and people self-medicate mm-hmm. uh, and con- condemn themselves mm-hmm. and, and to see them free, just, it, it's like a light bulb, you mm-hmm. know, it just, 
the joy, mm-hmm. um, but so many people are carrying that around mm-hmm. with them. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just sad. It is. It is. And you see how the enemy uses shame. Yes. Shame. And even when, you know, I'm free from that, but I can't, still, the enemy will try to use shame in my life to lure me back in. Yeah. You know, little things. He'll do whatever he can to try to keep us in that place. <laughs> Yeah, I th- I think of it as guilt because I lived so long with guilt in my life. Mm-hmm. And what it actually did is it kept me kind of estranged from Jesus. Right. Because I felt I wasn't good enough. He was perfect and I did all this stuff. And it's it's just a tool of the accuser. It is. Because yeah. that's what it does. Yeah. You know, because we don't. And I remember back to the first uh, study I had with you, and I I told you it was life-changing. It was, you know, what the sins aren't what we list and think of as sins, what's not important. It's not believing Jesus. Mm -hmm. And feeling all this guilt isn't really believing that Jesus took our sins, and He carried us, and He loves us. And and it's just, yeah. I think of all this, and I part of it is, again, you know, due to the way I was raised, but it makes me angry to think what he's doing, mm-hmm. what he what he likes, because if we can feel, you know, uh, guilt leads to depression. I mean, it, sh- it shuts us down. Exactly. To- totally robs us of the joy. Right. You know, so when I first, and I was praying for, I don't know how long, but for a long time to God to heal me, to to make me understand who Jesus really is mm-hmm. and accept him like that mm-hmm. because I saw other people who had this freedom and this joy in Jesus mm-hmm. and I didn't have it like I did with like God the Father and the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. but Jesus he was perfect and I'm not mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was just free and mm-hmm. I and I called my son and I told him I wanted to talk to him and I can remember what I said I kind of told him briefly about that but I said I'm free Mm-hmm. I'm free. Mm-hmm. So this condemnation and this thing of guilt too, mm-hmm. guilt, and it's it's not pious. It's mm-hmm. not believing what Jesus has really done right. for us. Right. Somebody at seven brought up a point, um, and they said, you know, wine is a symbol of the blood. If you think of the wine and the sacraments, it's a symbol of the blood. And I thought, I hadn't even thought of this, but think about all of that wine, does that not show how his blood is abundant for all of our sin as well? Just how much blood covering there is. You know, it's another thing that sign points to. I hadn't even thought of that. So that's pretty cool. And so I, I just think there's so much more in this story. There's so much more about this sign and this wedding feast and all of it that I haven't even tapped into yet. And it was, and I've been thinking on it all week. I've kind of been living it all week. <laughs> but there's so much more. Just see what he might bring to you and to your thoughts about it as we, um, you know, just think on it when we leave here and in the coming days. He's just showing us more about himself. That's what I, I just see him showing me more about himself. And it makes me want, want him to show me more. I have a question. When um, Mary went to Jesus and asked him, and his that line where it says, woman, mm-hmm. what does this have to do with me? Mm-hmm. I don't understand. I know. He, he referred to his mother as woman and questioned what, this, what does this have to do? Do you understand that line? Well, not really, but um, he did that on the cross, too, where he said, woman and then he said to john he is you know he is now your family or whatever what i don't remember and he said to john now this woman is now yours he referred to her that way in other times and so i don't think it was being disrespectful jesus never sinned so he wasn't being disrespectful i think part of it was just the way they talked in the day but but then the whole thing about so he dressed her that way but then my hour has not come that was what that was his answer. Is that what you're saying? Could it be that he called you Where's the mic? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Could it be that 
by calling her woman, that was the start of him separating and starting his ministry, separating from yeah, from maybe. her being his mom yeah. to him starting his maybe his Yeah, maybe that journey. was part of it. But um, what is that to me? What is that to me? My hour has not come. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, but somebody brought that up at seven and somebody said, um, you know, as moms, a lot of times we tell our adult children, we, we go and we, okay, you know, do this or do that. Or, you know, we kind of direct them in that way. And, um, and then the adult children kind of, maybe they do, or maybe they don't because they're adults now. <laughs> and maybe that was part of it. But um, I think it was more, you know, in all the different, I've read all these different commentaries about the story. It was more, he was looking pat, like Tim Keller said is what I put in here, that he was looking past, even though it wasn't his time to die yet, he was connecting that if he brings if he brings action into this right now, it's going to start the whole process. People hadn't seen the signs and wonders yet. And so for this, when the signs and wonders started, that put into action the whole walk to the cross. And so it was like, maybe it was kind of like in the Garden of Gethsemane where take this cup from me, but your will be done, Lord. And maybe it was kind of like that. Let's um, give the... Mike to her. You, Pass you the mic. Make me look bad. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and give it to Linda. Okay, no, say what you said, Linda. It, it differentiated him from being a mere mortal. Yes, it did. By doing something like that. Right. And so then <laughs> if people knew about it, they would be, they were already coming. Now, at this point, at this wedding, things hadn't yet happened. You got to remember that. Philip and John and Nathaniel and, you know, the five that were with him, they'd only been with him a couple of days. And so that's why I think that final line in verse 11 that says his disciples believed in him, they were going, wow, this confirms he really is what we thought. So they're seeing the very first sign. And so I think that's significant. But um, the more so that really was just... That was the that was saying, if I do this, Mom, you know what this is going to mean. That my hour is going to come soon, sooner than later. We're we're moving into it if I do this sign, and and it was time. So, um, I don't know. There's a mystery. I don't have all the answers, but I I think we did glean a lot from the story. And it's like, Lord, keep keep telling us what what you want us to understand about you from all of this. And so, any other thoughts? No? Okay, I think we will we will bake we will end. So let me close in prayer.